Right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. Here we go again. So, uh, a very interesting subject today, and one that's sort of linked to, I don't know, it sort of it links, links the old and the new format of the podcast. In, we've covered mental health and psychology for a long time. We've moved into more controversial topics, a lot of it psychology-based. Uh, today, we're talking about voluntary euthanasia. So, my guest today is Philip Nitschke. Philip is a former physician turned founder and director of the Euthanasia Advocacy Group, Exit International. Uh, in 1996, Philip became the first doctor in the world to administer a legal lethal voluntary injection, whose controversial in and innovative work has seen the media refer to him as both Dr. Death and the Elon Musk of assisted suicide. He's the recipient of a number of awards, including the Rainer Foundation Humanitarian Award and is an eight-time nominee and two-times state finalist for the Australian of the Year Award. He's also the co-author, along with Fiona Stewart, of the best-selling Peaceful Pill e-handbook, a book which provides information on euthanasia and assisted suicide for seniors, the elderly and the seriously ill. So, Philip, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Right, so like I, I sort of said in our uh, email correspondence, it's going to be an interesting one for me this uh, as an interviewer to sort of try and play devil's advocate because I said we've sort of, we, we sort of agree on about, I said initially we agree on about like 95% of things, I think. But in the research I've been doing in the meantime, I think we might have managed to bring that agreement down to about maybe 85, 90%. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm going to do my best to play devil's advocate, but I do think there's a couple of things that are, are, have, arguments that have brought up which I think are genuinely intriguing so I, I, I would like to spend a good portion of the the interview dealing with those uh, tackling some of the arguments against euthanasia uh, but of course you've got a very a very interesting history so I'd like to start with that first if you tell us because let's say initially you're a physician so I'm interested mm. in let's go let's go right back why why become a physician, interested in, in becoming a doctor in the first place, and then how did the interest in voluntary euthanasia develop out of that? Yeah, it's a, it is a bit of a long story in that sense. I, I mean, I was, I'd never thought of doing medicine at all. My background was such uh, that I came from a background where no, if, no one ever went to university, leave alone did, uh, did medicine. Uh, I was uh, able to, I had done quite well in my high school years, and uh, I never, uh, your choices were simple. You either did uh, science or you did some sort of humanities. And I decided to do science. I was good at physics, was my favorite. And I enjoyed it. And I went on, did a lot of physics, ended up with a PhD in physics. Oh. Uh, in, uh, and that was my career chart path. But always at the back of my mind had been this thought, I would have really liked to have done medicine. And anyway, I went off and did a lot of other things at that stage, because by that point, physics hadn't really maintained the same level of appeal. And Working in a lot of areas, uh, I found myself involved in national parks and wildlife conservation work in Central Australia, had a bad accident and uh, was actually effectively told that I could no longer do that sort of work. I had to go and retrain and I thought now's the chance. So at 35, I went back as a so-called mature age, somewhat geriatric student to do medicine. I went back to... <laughs> And the only university that would take me was Sydney, but I went back to Sydney University from the Northern Territory where I'd been living all that time of Australia and uh, did medicine, but much older than the average 18-year-old uh, average who was studying medicine. I found it hard going, not so much uh, because of the topic. I thought the topic was fairly straightforward, medicine, but the social issues were difficult. I didn't necessarily agree with many, uh, much of the attitudes that I found within the, the, teaching, of, of the, the teaching of that profession. I'd finished and went up to Darwin and I was glad to get out of Sydney back to the Northern Territory, which is my home, to do my first years of interning. And it was really while I was there working in the hospitals, as you do as part of the interning training, uh, that the first reference came up about euthanasia. And uh, it was something that had really never crossed my mind. I mean, I hadn't thought of it. I'd been involved in all sorts of issues from anti-Vietnam protests, uh, pacifist causes, anti-nuclear, etc., background of that sort of political interest, but never thought much about the issue of euthanasia. It had never been mentioned, the E word in medical school, went through six years of never even talking about it. Only palliative care, it only had a rather transitory mention in my final year. But in any event, it just seemed sensible to me. And when I heard about it on the radio, that there was to be a law brought in in the Northern Territory, this was 1995, 
uh, I heard about it on the radio, rolled over, went back to sleep. I thought this is a good idea and that was it. <laughs> and I got a huge surprise when over the next week or two, it was like uh, there'd been this unleashing of this immense air, uh, furor really from all over and from other parts of Australia, from around the world. But particularly the attacks were being focused from two groups, the church, which I suppose I was less surprised about, uh, but my new profession had come out very strongly. Uh, the Medical Association of Australia came out saying, this is an outrageous idea, there will, that we will not support it in any way. There is, And they went on to be a little more specific. They went on and said, there isn't a doctor in the Territory, the Northern Territory of Australia, who would ever support such a law. And I thought, that's funny. I thought it was a good idea. And I noticed that most people in the Territory, Territorians as they're called, thought it was a good idea too. They thought it was a, it was a very... Uh, progressive initiative from this leader of the government in the time. And so I thought, well, the people like it. I think it's good. And yet my new profession is there saying that it's, it's the wrong thing to do. And so that's how really the debate started. I objected to their decision to not support it. They said there wasn't, wouldn't be a doctor supporting it. And I said, well, that's not true. I support it. I ran around, polit involved politically, I ran around and found 20 other doctors in the Northern Territory, which wasn't easy, I might say. But I did find 20 and we took out a full page ad in the paper because that argument that the doctors were opposing it was starting to bite politically. People were saying, oh, it seems like a good idea, but gee, all the doctors are saying it's a bad thing. So maybe they know something that we don't know and gee, we should listen to the doctors. And so that argument was having an impact and it looked like it may not pass through the parliament in the Northern Territory. So me coming out with a bunch of doctors and full page ad not saying, well, that's not true. There are not a lot of doctors, but there are some who do support this idea was important politically. And when it came to the vote in, uh, it came to the vote in 1995, uh, it passed in that rather small parliamentary assembly by one vote. It's a 25 seat parliament that passed 13 votes to 12, right. absolutely down the middle. But that one voted with that one vote, it did pass. And so we had, what turned out to be the world's first legislation that allowed a doctor like me uh, to provide a lethal injection to a person who satisfied rather strict criteria. They had to be terminally ill and they had to be assessed as having been of sound mind and a few other requirements. But if all those conditions were met, it was possible to give a lethal injection to a terminally ill person. And as it turns out, uh, that's what I ended up doing. But that was the world's first legislation. The, in Oregon, America, there'd been a law passed around about the same time, but it would have been held up by legal challenges. And so the Northern Territory law came into effect on the 1st of July, 1996. And uh, we used it. I used it uh, a couple of months later in uh, in September of that year. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing there, Philip, is you going this idea of going from a, a supporter of the idea to i mean you know fr from all appearances exit international seems to be the most um well-known organization in the world that, that is pro euthanasia and so I'm, I'm i'm just interested how you went from being you know a, like you say a doctor that heard about it and thought well you know i i do support that to becoming sort of the, the figurehead of the movement you know i i would have thought maybe you've had, you had a dog in the fight in some way there's a you know, maybe the, the, you've uh, an illness in the family that you feel you're yeah. eventually going to face, or something like that. So, what made what what caused that transition from? Yeah, there was a, people often think, yeah, to to spend so much effort and effectively turn one's life around on this issue, there must have been something in my background. But I, there really wasn't. I mean, I and people quite uh, when I say people, mostly my opponents spend some time pointing out that I'd had rather little medical experience with elderly people or terminally ill. My background in medicine had been very brief. I'd only recently graduated. I was working in areas of, of drug, medical drug issues with young people predominantly, not elderly people and certainly not terminally ill people. But the, the compelling issue, I think, was that I, it wasn't that hard to put yourself into that position. I would say, well, look, if I was in this situation, I would want that, I would want that assistance. And I, if I want it, I can't see why other people wouldn't want it. And that was the general approach of the community. So... It was that aspect, and I think that I was absolutely taken aback by what I saw as the overwhelming, insufferable paternalism of my new profession, who was sitting there saying, look, we know what's best for you. That is the people of the, the broader community. You think you know about death, 
but we're the doctors and we know what's best for you and we're telling you you can't have this and I found that an intolerable position I I mean everyone knows about death they know about their own death and it, it's not something that can be delegated in my mind to the experts and the people who set themselves up as experts in my mind this was the new my new profession I think needed to be challenged and so that's how I got involved and of course they won I mean the combination of the medical profession and the church and their political influence got that law out after only eight months and I used we used it four times four people received lethal injections but uh, they won they got the law rescinded by the federal government of Australia who was by this stage internationally embarrassed by what was going on up in this backwater uh, the law was overturned and so I found myself then with no law, uh, but an awful lot of people saying, this is what we want. And that's really how Exit International started. I thought, all right, well, what can we do now? And uh, since that time, I've been working out what can we do now? And that's really come down to focusing on giving people strategies and the means and the methods by which they can have what they want. That is an elective death at the time of their choosing, peaceful and reliable, uh, giving them the means, that, or the means, and that's, predominantly the best information so they know what they're doing because it's not that easy unless you know what you're doing but making sure that information was out there and so exit set itself up doing that working on the principle that because suicide is not a crime just about anywhere there's a few places it is but predominantly it's not really a crime it's been decriminalized in most most uh, legislatures people are saying well if you want a peaceful death you may have to do it yourself but at least you know how to go about it and so that's where we got involved in getting good information and getting it packaged in a way that it was accessible to people around the world. And that's been uh, something which has been highly sought after, which is why, in a sense, there's been a lot of people uh, wanting to know what we're doing because uh, we've been quite good, I think, at least at getting this material out there. And, and, and whether, and as people say, whether governments change laws or not and whether they bring in legislation like many countries around the world have now done I ultimately want to make the decision and that's the problem with the legislative approach because it ultimately gives the power and the decision-making authority not to the individual but to some adjudicating body and for those who don't want that and the growing number don't uh, well I'm saying you can get your you can get your means and ways uh, by becoming involved with exit how how did it it come about that you managed to become the first doctor to administer the the lethal injection and also as well i think it's it's worth it's worth men mentioning something sort of procedurally about it because um the it sounds quite it sounds quite macabre on the face of it but there was mm. um the even in the case even in the case where it was you as the doctor administering the lethal injection the patient still ultimately um, took the, the final action themselves. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Now that, that was my decision. I mean, the, the legislation that was passed gave me the, if you like, legal right to go and uh, lawfully deliver a lethal injection. In other words, put the needle into, a per, into the patient's arm and push the plunger of the syringe and inject the drugs and have them die. I could have legally done that. Now, I didn't want to do that. Right. I mean, I would, I'd been fighting, if you like, passionately for the right of a person to have that option and I agreed with that fully but when it came down to that point I did not want to be the person who did that and I didn't have to be and that was the point I thought why it's not up to me to come there and do this they can do it themselves if they have what they need and so that's why I built a machine uh, the British the uh, deliverance machine which is now in the British Mu British Science Museum in London where a person as you pointed out presses the button so they have to do it. They have to initiate the process. They didn't have to do it from any legal or legislative me, uh, uh, requirement. They did it because I wanted them to do it. I wanted them to show the world that it wasn't some, uh, some uh, macabre situation with some uh, evil doctor running around putting down people who are comatose or anything of that nature. This was a lucid alert person. They had to read the questions which on the deliverance machine were presented on a laptop screen. Very blunt questions. And the third one was, if you press this button, you will die. Do you wish to go ahead? And if the person pressed the button on the laptop, this little machine then just delivered the uh, intravenous drugs and the person died. 
And what that did, but well, it did a lot of things, but the thing it did for me is that it got me out of that person's personal space. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sitting there alongside them with a syringe. It allowed other people who should be there, the ones that loved them to come in. So the machine got me out of the picture. I was in the room on the other side of the room watching, but I wasn't in that immediate personal space. And the other thing was it told the world that this was a person who's making the decision themselves, but there was no compelling, there was no uh, le legislative reason that it had to be done that way. It's something I chose to do. Right. So since since founding Exit International and being more involved in it, because like you say, you were sort of uh, a bit green around the gills when you, you know, yes. th this all started kicking off, you were new to the profession. But since since then, I guess you will have had um, a lot of experience with people that have got terminal illness, people that are suffering, people that are in pain. And yeah. um, I, I suppose one question is what a very basic question um, is what's what's wrong with a world in which euthanasia isn't available? You know, what what does what why is the world a worse off place without that as an option for many people? Well, I think the option, people keep saying, look, the option's always available. I mean, suicide's no crime and you can go and kill yourself. But, I mean, it's not that easy. You need to know what you're doing if it's to be a peaceful and reliable process, if it's to be something which is not some sort of uh, some sort of grisly and uh, sometimes uh, unfortunate event. I mean, uh, people can say, well, yes, you can go and kill yourself, but people say, well, why can't I have access to the best means and ways to do this? And I would think that that is or should be a person's right now. So why is it a worse world? Well, if we didn't have the ability for a person to get that information and get access to those drugs or whatever else it is that they choose to use, I guess we'll have more people lying on railway lines. Now, I don't know whether that wouldn't be a better world to my mind. I mean, people will suicide if they decide that that's what they wish to do. And uh, I think providing people with the ways and means that this can be a uh, a, a controlled and uh, reliable and peaceful process is, is uh, better for better for society. And I think people, when they have the comfort of knowing that they have this option, of course, often move away from that course. And so this idea that giving people access to this information and perhaps these drugs is going to lead to some spate of suicides around the world is not our experience. What it does do is give people the comfort that they have the ultimate control. And this idea of having ultimate control is a growing importance to the aging populations around the world. As people become older, we find, and I've certainly found in the last 25 years I've been doing this, that people really want the, the knowledge that they've got a safety net in place. Yes, they'd like to see laws change and they look at the laws and say, oh, well, if I'm terminally ill and I live in California, uh, I perhaps can qualify under, these, under the, the legislation in that state. But ultimately, I don't feel like going off and asking permission. The only permission, the only one who gives this permission is me. And I need to know that I can give this permission and then act upon it by having the knowledge and the means available. So that's why I think it's a better world. I think we have a better world and I would like to see a world where everybody had access uh, to the ways and means. I think we'd find, perhaps paradoxically, that we had a lowering of the suicide rate, especially amongst the elderly. We see it over and over. When people get their drugs, they say, I can stop worrying and I start relaxing. And I think they, by and large, live longer because they're back in control. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Um, so regarding Exit International, what are the, what are the sort of day-to-day -day activities of it? Um, and what's the, so we know what the, the mission of it, but I'm talking about like the, the practical aspects of it because um, you know, it's, it's supporting, it's providing people with information, but it's also providing p uh, people with information about actual methods and yeah. also to what extent is, does it help people, uh, not just gain the, the knowledge for um the methods but the actual apparatus or the medication required like can you actually buy the medication from from exit international um again not just medication but if if someone would rather do it by a particular method can you buy the tools required from exit international how, how does that work yeah it's a difficult it's a difficult legal issue i mean when i kept i've mentioned a couple of times that suicide is not a crime but of course in most countries west in the western world at least assisting a suicide is not only a crime it's a serious crime yep so you've got this rather uh legislative uh, or legal paradox whereby 
we've got two pieces of, if you like, legislation or law that don't agree. You've got suicide is no crime and anyone who helps you carry out this legal process or lawful process of ending your own life can find themselves thrown in prison for over 10 years. In fact, two of the states of Australia still have the maximum penalty the state can issue, which is life imprisonment for assisting someone to do something which is lawful, which is suicide. So this paradox is not has not really been resolved. And so at one of the difficulties there is, of course, we have to be careful because if you go around telling people how they can end their lives, is that assisting? Because if it's assisting, it would be a serious crime. Uh, there seems to have been a very grey area in the middle. If I go, if I come along and give you the drugs, here you are, here you are, here's your drugs, 15 grams of Nembutal. That's the best end of life drug. If I give it to you, I'm assisting, and you take it, and I have every knowledge that this is your plan, I'm assisting you and I will be unlikely to see the light of day for the next decade or so in prison. But if I tell you where you can get your Nembutal from, I say get on an aeroplane a little harder these days and go to Peru and buy it over the counter, is that a crime? And of course that's where this grey area starts to kick in. Is the provision of information the same as the practical provision of assistance? And so far, because it's been looked at a lot around the world, and I've gone to a lot of these kind of inquiries, uh, it's been more or less decided that the provision of information is safe, whereas the provision of actual materials or items involved in this process, and you talked about not just drugs, but many people use other strategies and techniques that require a bit of equipment, does the provision of that equipment uh, amount to a crime and then it starts to become a little more difficult and we have to be careful. So we don't provide drugs, we tell people where they can get them. We provide bits and pieces of equipment but not the complete set so that you'll have to go and do something else besides deal with us. And uh, we sort of work our way, we tiptoe along this path, making sure, hoping that we don't make any mistakes and because making mistakes could have serious consequences legally for us. Um, and so far we've done all right, although there's been some difficulties, of course, that's one of the reasons I'm no longer registered because it was considered uh, that my approach to this issue was so damaging and dangerous, it was declared, I was declared a uh, danger to the Australian public uh, by the Australian Medical Board, who had a rather fractious relationship anyway, after the original, original encounter back in 1996. But at that point, we began to realise that there really was a great difficulty in trying to work within uh, a society with the profession of medicine taking the views that they do. So I don't think I'm a danger to society. They did. Uh, I had myself deregistered under their emergency provisions. I had to take them to court. I won the case and they said, all right, well, you can be a doctor in Australia, but you cannot author the book that gives people this information. In other words, you've got to take your name off what has now become the world's best-selling book on how to end your life. And so that struck me as being a total, uh, totally unacceptable condition. So I said, no, with some ceremony, burnt my medical registration and headed overseas to, to what is a much more comfortable climate here in the Netherlands, where we can at least talk about these issues without having the sort of histrionic reaction that I saw back in my home country. Yeah, it's, well, speaking of speaking of the book, um, so I've uh, I've done I've done as much research as I, as I can into the book. Um, in in fact, it's we'll probably talk about um, the 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 criteria by which people are uh, are able to the criteria that people have to meet in order to to access the book um, mm -hmm. and to access help from from exit international but just while i'm thinking about it now when i was going through the, the table of contents there's various sort of medications listed and and, and various methods to end your own life and the, i'm guessing the whole thing with 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 this voluntary euthanasia is you want the surely you want the process to be as peaceful as as possible um but also as um efficacious as possible we don't, you know. I mean, like you were saying before, we, we've I've sort of talked on the pod on about on the podcast in the past about how um, there's a a sort of an ungodly amount of people that survive suicide, but then end up with severe injuries, lifelong disabilities, even brain damage from things like, you know, trying trying to hang themselves and things like that. Um, so, how do you guys choose the methods 
that you publish and how do you know that they're both peaceful and and effective methods yeah it's important i mean we've surveyed of course their membership uh, quite often but we've always asked them what is it that they're interested in and of course what comes back overwhelmingly clearly is that they want something which is peaceful and something which is reliable they don't want to mess around with something that might work if they make the decision they wish to die, they want to know that it will work. And so reliability is very, very important. So in terms of the other part of your question, how do we know? We've done a lot of work in watching and looking at and uh, assessing as best we can uh, suggested means by way by whereby a person could end their own lives. And so uh, means, ways and means don't really make the cut unless they, uh, unless they fulfill those requirements. We have a bit of a grading scheme where we rate different messages in terms of their reliability and their peacefulness. And of course, the third major criteria is availability. So we call it the RPA test. Um, but basically, it tries to look at things like reliability and peacefulness and the availability of the option. And so uh, we can grade some of these methods and strategies. Now, there are some things there which are incredibly reliable, but certainly not peaceful and vice versa. We try to make sure that people are well aware of these issues so that when they make a choice of all the strategies that are available, they pick one which suits them. Right. OK. Yeah, because I mean, this sort of leads into uh, let me just do a bit of a screen share at the moment. So if you just like to um, tell people about this device here. Yep. So this is the Sarco device, and this is an invention yeah. of yours. Um, yeah. And so, again, this I, I guess this is sort of, I mean, you invented this the deliverance machine, which, uh, which involved computer intervention uh, so that it was the, the patient themselves which could ultimately administer a lethal dosage. Um, and this is, I guess, in something that's a bit more <laughs> like the deliverance machine 2.0. This is probably what's gained you the Elon Musk um title um so again how do you come up with this idea how do you know that it works um and why i mean is this is this the is this the ultimate machine for ending one's own life basically well it's item as the ultimate machine i mean it came about because i was asked by the lawyers for a person in uh, in uh, united kingdom who was seriously ill with uh, with locked in syndrome uh, and he was attempting to attempting to put a put a mounted test case against British law. He was arguing that because he was so disabled by his disease, that he had effectively lost the right that an able-bodied person would have. That is the right and ability to end your own life. Now that case didn't go very far, but his lawyers contacted me and said, "Is there any way a person who was seriously disabled could effectively end their lives without requiring help? Because it's the provision of help which leads to this." leads to this breach of the laws which prohibit assistance. And the idea of the SARCO, because generally people, it's a long tried and used method that people suddenly immerse themselves in an inert gas and take a deep breath, faint and die. That method is well known and it's, it's used a lot and we spent a big section of the handbook that we've written gives people the details. It's known as a hypoxic death. You're suddenly breathing an air, a gas which has no oxygen and perhaps paradoxically or surprisingly, People often find this a little hard to believe, but it is actually extremely peaceful. You simply faint immediately and you die shortly thereafter. Unfortunately, the usual way to do this though involves things like plastic bags. And there's a sort of uh, the idea that then there's a lot of sort of reaction sort of against the aesthetics of this. And people often say, oh, look, I don't want to, I just don't want that paraphernalia and equipment. You need a cylinder of gas, you need a regulator, you need this and you need that. So to get around the idea of the yuck factor, as we called it, with plastic bags, and to look at making something which might be usable by someone like Tony Nicholson, the idea of using some uh, more sophisticated technology to build something which was elegant and stylish, that was one of the criteria, this is the Sarko, something that looks good, you can take it to a nice place, and then with minimal effort, you can climb in and press a button. And inside, uh, you press a button, and it makes no use of... Uh, hard to get uh, drugs because the deliverance machine I used back in 1996, I had to get the Nembutel to use that. And of course you can't get that drug unless you've got all sorts of good reasons for it. But this Sarko machine doesn't use that. It uses nitrogen, which is of course freely available. There's no way it could possibly be restricted. You only have to press a button. It doesn't require any sort of sophisticated uh, 
expertise to get you the kind of, uh, technical assistance. If you can get yourself inside a Sarko and press the button, you will die. We've got a little bit of extra material there because one of the criteria that Exit is quite clear about is that we don't want people who don't know what they're doing. In other words, people that are not of sound mind, people who have lost mental capacity to start accessing and misusing this sort of information and material. So to try and get around that issue, uh, we have built in or we're in the process of building in a requirement whereby you have to have some test of your mental capacity to be able to activate the Sarco. So it is really a futuristic design, a keypad on the side, you do your little online test. If it's just, if the online test using an artificial intelligence process deems you to be a person of sound, sound mind, that will issue you with a code, which only gives you 24 hours in which you can press the keypad, climb in and press the button inside and peacefully die. You will die very quickly and peacefully because that capsule, as you showed there on the diagram, is flooded very quickly with nitrogen. Uh, there's a generator below that makes use of liquid nitrogen, but it's a very quick way of dropping the oxygen level in the capsule. Uh, you'll faint immediately and you'll die shortly thereafter. Uh, you can say goodbye to your friends, climb in and find a nice place. It can be totally portable. You can have it overlooking wherever you have it overlooking. It's 3D printed. Uh, it'll be first used. It's all in lockdown now, like everything is here in Europe. Uh, but it will be used in Switzerland. We had hoped by now, but it's sitting in uh, Amsterdam and it's about to go to, uh, to Switzerland where it can be used. And the reason for Switzerland is because they've got unique legislation. Because if I build the machine and give it to you, there will also be the ar argument that I'm assisting you. That's not a case under Swiss law. So that's where we'll trial it. And if it works as we expect it to, we'll make it available to the world. Yeah, well, that's that's one thing I, I was I was sort of wondering is the the logistics of it because obviously it's not something you can just sort of a, a order on Amazon and and get it delivered. So not yet. No, not yet. Um, so with the three D printing process, I mean that's that's tricky for people to get access to as well. I'm guessing at the mo at the moment, how I mean, how much is does something like this cost for somebody to put together? Well, we've only got two of them. There's one that you showed mostly in those photographs, which is the first one, which became a demonstration. And that's currently sitting in, uh, it was down in Venice for Venice Design last year. It was on display there. And now it's up in uh, a design museum in the Netherlands. Uh, the practical one, the first one that'll be used, because we've made a few design modifications, has been 3D printed in the city of Harlem in the Netherlands and is sitting there waiting for use. And a bit of testing first and then it will go down and be used in Switzerland, as I said, supposedly in spring this year, which is now, uh, but it won't be until we get uh, clear of this uh, incredibly paralyzing lockdown, which is affecting the whole of, uh, whole of the world, really, uh, so that we can move freely. We can't, for example, I can't leave where I am now easily and get back to the Netherlands. I'm stuck here in France, uh, and I need to get back up there and then uh, test the machine which won't take long, uh, and then by testing, and I mean testing it using, uh, in laboratory testing, I've got laboratory in, in the Netherlands, uh, not with like people or with animals, it's testing uh, whereby we measure the gas levels inside the machine when activation takes place, etc. And then it will be uh, tied onto its little trailer and uh, and uh, towed off down to to Switzerland where we have a, a lot of people who want to who wanna use it. So uh, some person will, I guess be fortunate enough to be the person who is able to first climb in and, and press the button. It was originally designed so the capsule could be lifted off as your coffin and you could be effectively buried in that. That's because of the difficulty in producing the first one. That won't be the case. It'll be used over and over. But when they're completed with the new design, it does have that option of having a capsule which you can be effectively buried in or cremated in or I don't know, sail out to sea, and but it's it's it can be your final your final resting uh, resting container. Yeah, well, what I th one of the things you said then was that you, you said that there's going to be uh, an an AI test involved yeah. in it. Um, yeah. So is is that so? That's still in development, I'm guessing. Um, right, and that, that's proving to be a very very difficult one. Well, and what, in the meantime, and in the meantime, well. I, 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 in the meantime, we're going to have to fall back to the old tried and tried and proven method of measuring whether a person has got uh, has sound mental capacity, and we're going to be getting a, a Swiss psychiatrist to uh, to effectively 
sign off on the people who want to use the SARCO, which is, of course, the standard procedure which is used around the world. Most of the legislative models for assisted dying require some sort of indication of the person who's using the process or the laws in whichever state or place are of sound mind. And that usually comes down to some person, usually a psychiatrist, doing some form of assessment. We don't want that, and we're trying to get rid of it using artificial intelligence, uh, but it's not an easy one. Uh, and, of course, uh, in the meantime, we don't want to have that particular aspect of the project slow it down, so we're going to effectively say, oh, well, that's too hard right now. We'll keep on working on that one, but in the meantime, there will be a psychiatric review of the people that will be using the SARCO. What, um, what is it about, was it, was you could say it was called Nembutol? Yes. Yeah, Nembutol. So, I mean, what is it about Nembutol that's lacking that this is a, this is, um, a better method? Because obviously if you've got the perfect pill and yeah. um, you can jump on a plane and go get it from the right country, that, that yeah. seems a lot easier to access than something like this with artificial intelligence and 3D printing yeah. and things like that. So... Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think, there, and there'll be a lot of people who agree with you. We've got an awful lot of people who say when they look at, I, I talk about this, this the project, the Sarko project, when I'm talking to meetings of our, our members and the like, and you can almost divide people in two groups. They say, well, I don't, I don't want it. I don't want anything like that. I just want something simple. I just want to be able to simply lie in my bed and take a simple, often they say tablet, or well, Nembutal is a small drink, a small drink and go to sleep and die. That is Nembutal. Right. And that's what they want. Now, they can do that, but they can't do it without breaking the law because in almost everywhere, the acquisition and possession of that drug is a crime. And so there's a whole business that goes on. And if you just type into the internet, I want to buy some Nembutal, you'll get hundreds of places offering to cheat you. They are all cheat sites. They're all scam sites. Trying to trick the elderly into saying yes to this, send, you, send us your money and you get nothing back. These, these are not places that are selling you this drug. Uh, there are a few places that do do, but if you do it, you need to be very aware that you're breaking the law. And of course, every now and then there's huge raids that take place around the world, whereby after some breakdown in uh, communication with the, between the distributor and the recipient, you start getting visits from the police and so-called wellness checks to see whether or not you're a person who's about to kill yourself uh, and whether you need some sort of compulsory psychiatric review. Now, all of that is a bit of a worry to many people, and they say, I don't want, I want, bit, I don't see why I have to go breaking the law. I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm 75 years old, I've never broken a law in my life, and suddenly I have to become some sort of latter day illegal drug importer just to get this option, which I believe is a fundamental right that I should have. Now, that's just the way it is, but if that's your situation, you can take this legal option of using a SARCO because a SARCO doesn't require the use of illegal or controlled substances. And it doesn't require the use of anyone to assist you. You don't need any help. As I said, you don't need someone clever to try putting needles in your veins or anything like that. And you don't have to break laws getting substances which are heavily prescribed. The nitrogen which it uses, of course, is everywhere. That's not a, that's not a controllable substance. Right. Okay. Interesting. I've got to say with it, the, the Sarko machine, Philip, what's, I've always said to my other half, I've got a intense fear of, of dying in hospital. I just, the idea of lying in a bed there under them glaring lights in a, in this sterile environment. Like I saw my dad die in hospital in that way. And I, I've always said to her, look, if, when it comes my time, you know, if I'm lucky enough that say the doctors come in and tell you like, he's not going to last the night. I, I I want her to stick me in a, one of them hospital wheelchairs and go get me, just wheel me out into a forest or on a beach or somewhere in nature and just leave me there. And just, if I'm not going to last the night, I want to, I want to do it by myself out in nature. And there is something very um, attractive about that, that, that pod, this pod that you've invented where you can choose the time and the place and like with that glass screen over it and you can, you can choose the scenery and just go to sleep and never wake yeah. up. It's uh, yeah. It's I don't know. It's the way forward. <laughs> the more the more I think about it, that the, the more I think about l my death being something. Obviously, if I have an heart attack or a stroke, something spontaneous, there's obviously nothing I can do about that. But the idea of being able to, you know, if you, you get given that terminal diagnosis or anything like that, there's something so reassuring and empowering about going. I'm not doing that. 
I'm not going through all that. I'm going to choose like the, the time and, and the day. And I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> a lot of my listeners, especially the old ones from the, the old format, are not going to approve of me saying this, but I think it's a, I think it's a genuinely brilliant idea. Um, but just quickly before we get into, uh, tackling the, these arguments against euthanasia, um, one of the one of the the biggest sort of complaints that you seem to face in in the various news articles is uh, somebody has contacted the newspaper or they've turned up to uh, like a conference or a, a class that you're running to tell you that you shouldn't have um given any advice to their mother father daughter son what have you um and no point in dealing with any particular individual case but what it, what is worth covering is what what precisely is the um, what what's the criteria that somebody has to meet in order to get direct advice from Exit International? So not just to browse on the website, but to actually speak to somebody on the phone or to get hold of the ebook and and something that's a bit more direct than that. Yeah, I mean my my position on this issue has changed. There's been a real evolution in my thinking on this. When I was first involved, as we talked about earlier, back in 1995, I was a doctor. I thought it was quite reasonable I could somehow or other decide whether or not the person satisfied the criteria of our new laws. And if I decided that you were sick enough to qualify, I could then legally help you die. But that was challenged pretty fast and quick after the law was overturned and I was running around the countryside seeing whether or not we could work out some way under the carpet people who were sick could get help. Uh, and I was challenged by a woman that I met in Western Australia who came to a meeting and said, look, I want some information about drugs to end my life. I'm going to die in four years' time. And I said, what, what, what sort of disease is this? And she said, I'm not sick at all. She said, I'm, a, I'm going to be 80 in four years' time, and that's the time to die. And I thought, oh, this is a bit strange. I thought I, would, I didn't believe her. Every time I went back to that city, I'd have another meeting, and she'd be there, and she said, when are you going to answer my questions? It's three years, and it was two years I thought she's serious. I thought she was just talking as people say all sorts of things, but she was serious. And, and I, I looked, I said, let's say she was a, Fr a French woman who was retired in Australia, an ex-academic. And I said, let's say, I said, for goodness sake, I said, you're not sick. Go on a cruise, write a book. And she said, mind your own business. She said, this has got nothing to, <laughs> nothing to do with you, doctor, she said. She said, all as I want from you is technical information. She said, if it's going to come with a sermon, forget it. It's not up to you to run. She said, you run around the countryside, you impose your little template of suffering on everyone else, and if they satisfy your requirements, that is, that you think they're sick enough to warrant your help, you involve yourself. And said, it's not up to you. We make, I make this decision. All as I want from you is technical information, she said. And it could have been the other way around. You've got information because of your background and your training and I want it. She said, I went off and studied different things. I was, she was a French academic. She said, it could have been the other way around. You could have had my background and you would have been sitting here asking me questions. And so she, and that's when she accused me. She said, you, you, you're the worst example of insufferable medical paternalism. And I thought, oh my God, just about died with the accusation. I thought, she's right. I can't sit around here judging what people want to do. If a person makes a sound decision to end their lives, I thought, well, they should be able to do it for whatever reason. Often it's sickness, often it's suffering, but not always. There are plenty that have unusual reasons like I'm about to be 80. But if it's a rational, thought-out position, my feeling at that stage changed. And I thought, I've got, I've got no reason to come along and second-guess what to her is a valid position. And so I started to change the direction and emphasis of exit. Now we consider, I consider, I must say I have some trouble with the rest of the organisation, but my personal position is that every rational adult should have the right and means to a peaceful death. And by adult, I mean people, as I got interviewed back in a long time ago in one of the National Review in the US and said, so you're talking about troubled teens? And I said, well, no, but I accept the fact that teenagers are adults. Once you get past 18, you're considered to be an adult, and I can't see any reason why you should not have the ways and means to end your life. As I pointed out at the time, we're quite happy to give teenagers or 18-year-olds guns and tell them to go off and kill other people uh, in the form of the military and the like, yet as soon as we suggest even that they might have the ways and means to end their own lives, everyone starts to panic. Now, I don't think that's right. I believe that it should be a rational, and uh, it wasn't just me, of course. I, mean, I started to do a lot of reading at this stage, and 
it's been written about a lot, of course, and there's plenty of people that outline in great detail why it's a fundamental right. It's the most fundamental of rights that you be able to divest yourself of this precious life uh, and that it be your decision. It's a right that the government should have no, has no right, this is, this is Sir Thomas Sass, has no right to interfere with. And I think I agree fully with that. So my personal position is adult of sound mind. Now, you've got to be a sound mind. You've got to know what you're doing. It's no good if you have lost the ability to have so-called mental capacity, so you're lying there not knowing which way is up and down, then you should not be able to take this step. So you have to be a person who's of sound mind. But if you are of sound mind, and most people are, uh, then you should have, I would argue, the ways and means. Now, for various political reasons, the organisation, Exit, has effectively now somewhat, somewhat reeled in my enthusiastic guidelines and now it's people over the age of 50 uh, arguing that you've got to have some sort of significant life experience and you don't get that at the age of 18. So I've rather grudgingly kind of uh, held to this line uh, that it's to be people over 50 uh, of sound mind. And if you're over 50 and of sound mind, we will give you the information and uh, all the assistance, by assistance we have to say in the form of information, in other words, treading that rather difficult line along what constitutes assistance that we can. Uh, if you're younger than 50, well, perhaps you've got a good reason and plenty do. And then of course we do engage with those people and we uh, make sure they have the information too. And sometimes we've made a few mistakes. Uh, and of course, uh, sometimes people are very keen to remind us of those mistakes. It's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult line. Sometimes people tell us all sorts of things about why uh, they want access to this mirror and sometimes we get tricked. But Generally, by and large, I would argue that overwhelmingly the activities of the organisation in providing this information has actually extended the overall longevity of many people. Because as I said earlier, when you have this information and perhaps the drugs in the cupboard, you stop worrying. And when you've got the, when you've got the drugs there and stop worrying, you actually live longer. Now, that's a bit hard to prove. Uh, but uh, we've got a wealth of anecdotal material which, which backs that up. Yeah, so ju just to clarify as well, so when, when people are required to be sort of 50 years old, do they have to sort of provide you with their ID and prove it with uh, like a webcam chat or something like that? Yeah, yeah that, it's been tightened up. I mean, there's, there's quite a few requirements like that. Of course, people send, had, had been sending in all sorts of things. So the, uh, uh, the, the criteria now are fairly strict. People get, we do, they do checks on most people who make, make suggestions that they want access to the book to prove their age. It's uh, difficult to try and provide any kind of proof of mental capacity. It's extremely difficult. Um, so we have to try and tread this line and making sure that the information gets out to the vast majority of people who really want it, while hopefully not uh, providing it to, too, to a too big a number of people who might uh, effectively misuse that information and perhaps die prematurely. Look, it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, and most of the criticism that comes our way is over the fact that we've made... Uh, you know, that we've been too, it's been too easy to get access to this information. I'm, I'm somewhat sceptical about the argument, this idea that the world would be a better place if everyone sat there and knew nothing. And that's kind of the argument, which kind of underpins most of the uh, the suicide prevention programs, the argument that if you don't know how to go about it, you won't do it. The idea that we'll just sit there in some sort of glass cage and stare at the wall and smile for the rest of our lives because we don't know how to take this step. That's not a healthier society. It might be a longer living society, but it's not a healthier society. I think a healthier society is when people have all the information, have all the information and perhaps the means, and then make rational decisions to do what they see is in their best interest. Now, that's not a terribly popular view, but it's one that uh, Exit has more or less tended to, tended to pursue. And, of course, we see Sarko as part of that process of effectively providing everyone with that option. Right. Okay. So let's let's deal. We laid a, a decent, solid foundation there. But let's let's run through some of, and there are a lot of them. So we're not going to go through all of them. I'm gonna I'm gonna take some of some of the arguments against euthanasia, uh, and I've judged which ones to include based on the sort of on on the substance of them, on the how how much how popular they are as an argument. But then also, I'm going to include ones that I've sort of inadvertently found quite convincing as well. Um, I'm going to exclude religious arguments. I don't think they are. I don't think they're a valid argument, especially in a secular society. 
And especially, you know, when it comes to someone who's secular themselves, it's 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 completely irrelevant. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pay lip service to three of them. I don't really think there's much much point in delving into these first three, but the the, the first one is that no one of truly sound mind would ever ask to die. So that is, you know, it, the idea that this Darwinian instinct to to live is so strong within a, within human beings that if somebody is desiring death, um, what they actually need is mental health assistance. Um, again, I, d I mean, I don't know if you've got anything to say on that, Philip, but I th I'm... I'm... Oh, yeah. i got a quick quick comment about it. I mean, that is the medical approach to it. The idea that anyone who suicides is uh, really a person who's mentally ill. Anyone who wants to suicide is a person who's mentally ill, and the best, best way to deal with it is not to pass some sort of legislation which allows a person to get help to die, but the best way is to make sure they have adequate uh, mental assistance so that they no longer take that course i i just think i just think that uh, idea that all suicide is underpinned by mental malady is a clearly false argument i mean we have we have people who are suiciding every day some of them for very clear reasons which are not medical we read about suicide bombers for example every day now we're not suggesting they're all mentally ill we're not saying they're nice people but they're clearly not people who would benefit necessarily from therapy so what I'm getting at, suicide's a much bigger issue than simply trying to narrow it down, as many in the medical profession do, into this, you're either sick or you're not sick, and it's all to do with men. I just don't have much argument. Um, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you only need to go on YouTube and see to, to see interviews with people who've got various diseases, terminal illnesses, and just how, how much suffering the human body is capable of when it goes wrong to realise that you, you you don't need to be mentally ill in order to uh, in order for ending your own life to be a completely rational decision. Uh, another one is allowing euthanasia would create a situation where someone is euthanised by mistake, um, which to me sounds like. I don't know. It sounds like some sort of argument for, you know, this could be a sort of procedural uh, mismanagement or something. And it seems to me that the the numbers involved in something like that are going to be negligible, if not completely non-existent. I, 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 I struggle to find any substance to that argument, um, which is why I'm not really bothered to include it. Some people unexpectedly recover from other, sometimes are diagnosed from terminal illnesses. Again, I, you know, I would argue again that the, the numbers involved of people that have spontaneous remission from, um, from stage four cancer is, is negligible. Um, let's yes, I've heard the argument though. People often do say that, well, they should, uh, you know, stick around. You might, there may be a cure that sort of thing. But I mean, you're ultimately my feeling is you must leave that decision to the individual who's going yeah. through it. You can come along and, and second guess that. What about the suicide um, or euthanasia devalues human life? That human life is sacred in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of, in a secular sense in that it's the, you know, it's the most important thing it, like interpersonally. It's the, it's this precious transient gift that you're, that you're given and that you should, you know, we're, we're sort of bookended by eternity on either sides of this this little flash of light that we experience as life, and that as much as that you can that you can get out of that life, or as long as you can stick around, you should do. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, yeah, that argument that I mean, I don't think I disagree with this idea that human life is a precious commodity, a valuable commodity, uh, and some would say a sacred commodity. But and it's a gift. People talk about this idea of a gift. And I think my thinking there is so that a gift that you can't give away is not a gift. If it's a gift that you've been given, well, that's nice. But surely if it's a gift, you've got the option to divest yourself of that gift when you believe for whatever reason, you believe for whatever reason that that gift is no longer a gift. It's an owner. It's an onerous burden. It's a chore. It's something that you don't want. You surely must have that right to be able to give it away. A life that you cannot give away, that's no gift. That's a, uh, that's a burden. Okay, let's talk about some of the more convincing ones then. Um, uh, the first one is that euthanasia becomes, voluntary euthanasia becomes part of legislation. Um, and then that is going to sort of undermine the, the patient-doctor relationship. That um, people are, you know, to an extent the doctor is in charge of a person's care. Um, and especially, I think this, this argument is especially um, prescient in, in socialised healthcare systems um, where you know, like the costs of, of social health care are, are high and particularly it's skewed, the, the costs are skewed towards the elderly 
And with all these advancements in, in, in diet and nutrition and medicine, the, the population's getting older and older anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so I suppose the argument would go that there would be, uh, well, the first argument would be that there's maybe going to be societal pressures for people that are, that are elderly or chronically ill to end their own lives um, based on the fact that you, you sort of, you're a drain on society, you're a drain on the economy sort of thing. Yeah, there's often, it's often dis described as uh, something which is about to happen. I can't see much evidence that it has happened. But the idea that when there was this initial passage of pieces of legislation, such as the first one in the Northern Territory, but now, of course, many places around the world have laws that allow a person to get legal help to die if they satisfy these strict criteria, that, of course, that this is the state working at ways to try and cut down its health uh, its health budget by effectively providing the ways and means to get rid of this particularly expensive category of human uh, and allow them this easy way out and that they're motivated purely by the fact that there's some sort of uh, there's some sort of economic uh, benefit to be had from from uh, allowing such a process I mean I can't see much uh, I, I can't see much uh, evidence uh, for that there'd be some financial gain from that. I mean, many people say that there's a big financial gain for society to keep people alive because they'll keep on consuming. Uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry to keep people alive. But these arguments go backwards and forwards. But uh, to my mind, the idea that the world will become such that uh, driven by financial ration rationalization of health reserves and resources, we'll start to see people pressured to die. I see very little evidence that that's taking place. Now, it's come up a bit with COVID with the idea that because of a, the idea that there'll be some need for extreme rationalisation of uh, intensive care facilities, the access to ventilators and the like, there'll be some form of extreme triage going on and those people that are elderly and not quite up to it as far as uh, whatever standards we're using will be the ones who don't get the chance at the ventilator. So in a sense, it's, that's the state making that same sort of decision. And I suppose we have to say that could well happen. It could well happen in the future. But I don't think that the provision of the ways and means to allow a person to make this individual choice is, is the thin end of the wedge on that requirement. That's something that we're going to have to watch anyway, no matter how it comes about. I think that the benefits, as I said earlier, uh, and a healthier society comes when you've got a bunch of people out there who say, look, I've got control. I don't care what you're doing about whether or not you're developing and making access to these differing sophisticated healthcare services. I want to know that I've got this option. And uh, to my mind, that's a healthy way to go, not some way of uh, effectively solving the state's financial problems. Yeah, I think with, with this with this idea of it undermining the pa patient-doctor relationship, um, it's... Yeah, I, I, I do think that's sort of brought home with the idea of you know not not just not just societal pressure and the government and the economy, but like the sort of day to day pressures that doctors face to sort of meet targets and and budget according to especially with socialized healthcare they've, they're given these government budgets and that it would be just cheaper to to sort of pop pop somebody off or encourage them to do it as a doctor when you know you've taken the sort of Hippocratic oath do no harm it's your job to try and. Uh, apparently, it's your job to try and you know do your best to bring people back to health. Um, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's a stretch to imagine a world where, and even if it's just a small percentage of doctors that, either based on the you know their own personal ambition, their their own, um, their their own alliance to 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 the state and to socialized healthcare, that that some of them would. Um, would prefer to, to use those measures occasionally rather than continue healthcare. I mean, I, I know it's anecdotal, but I just remember, I remember it, w we've got the NHS over here, which I'm very um, sort of sceptical of, which is, you know, that's sacrilege saying that over here. But, um, you know, I remember when my dad died, there was very much a sort of feeling of, you know, could you sort of, could you get in there and get the grieving process over and done with because we need the bed sort of thing. We were, there was, there was a very active feeling of nurses and doctors coming in every sort of 20 minutes, like he's dead, walk, you know, leave him alone. It's, it's over and done with. Um, so let's, okay, let's, let's, let's move on from that one. Um, I, I, I'd just like to cool. agree with that. I mean, the, 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 the problem, there is a problem with the medical profession's uh, hyper-involvement in, in being part of the adjudicating process about who gets access to the ways and means. And that's what I'm really 
like about the Swiss system, which is quite unique. I mean, in every country of the world, there's some sort of adjudicating body that decides whether or not you're eligible to make and take advantage of these legislation, pieces of legislation that give the option of having your, your life ended. And that's invariably panels of doctors. So effectively, the medical profession, apart from trying, as I experienced in my early years, doing everything they could to undermine the passage of such legislation, now that the legislation is passed in many places, they want to take total control of it. Now, the thing about the Swiss system is that they don't have that power. The Swiss system recognises that a person has the right to end their own life. It's got nothing to do with doctors and it's got nothing to do with sickness. It's an individual's option. The only reason that doctors are involved in the process at all in Switzerland, well, there's two reasons. One is that in, in organisations such as Dignitas or the one that I'm more involved in, which is the new one, Pegasus, there's a need to get Nembutal prescribed. And so a doctor has to control, has to do that. They're the ones that have access to that drug. So there is a need to have a doctor's involvement. And the other means or ways that a doctor has to be involved in the situation in Switzerland is that the criteria which is universal that a person be of sound mind must be met. And so far, until we get our artificial intelligence machine working, that has to be provided by a psychiatrist. So the medical profession are still involved to some degree in Switzerland, but it does get around that issue of trying to medicate There's something whereby codify the degree of suffering and then judge it. And then, as it's often said, a sick person really has to go and ask for permission to die. And it's given to you almost as a gift to the person who's sick enough to qualify. And I call most of those laws that we see being passed around the world beg and grovel legislation. We insist that people come along and beg and grovel for the right to die. Now, I don't want that. I want a situation where everybody has this right and they have this option and they don't have to seek permission. And it's that permission controlling process, if anything, which is going to undermine the doctor-patient relationship. Yeah, one that's one that's sort of tied to that, which again I think is uh, even slightly more convincing or slightly more of a concern than the the the, the doctor's intervention and uh, whether they encourage it or whatever, is the 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 issue about people feeling that they're a burden to the family and the family sort of encouraging them, um, which on the face of it it sounds like an unlikely prospect that, but you know some families are fucking awful and 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 some families do treat ill sick relatives like a bird and they can't be asked looking after them um again i remember like when my nana was sick and it was just my mum and me looking after her and she had a million other relatives that were they were always around her house all the time all with, with food and borrowing money and stuff like that but as soon as she got sick no one wanted to know and and it, the place was de was desolate and mm. and then so then you're in this tricky situation where you know, even a person might be choosing voluntary euthanasia, well, semi-voluntary euthanasia, I guess, based on encouragement from the family or just by virtue of the fact that they feel like a burden to the family and not even in, in a necessarily in a charitable way, but they just feel, they feel like shit because they've realised that the family don't care about them. And on the one hand, you could say, well, that's a legitimate reason because you know, they've made a rational decision that they are sick and their family don't care about them. And so they're in a situation like, why would they want to carry on in that situation anyway? But also, you're not just bringing to bear the person person's own rational decision. You bring in to bear the, the influence of the family that are almost sort of pushing them into it. And how do you get around that? Well, I mean, it's true. I mean, we're all, we're not, all of us are socially immersed, of course, uh, and we are experiencing all forms of influences from around us. But I and people often say this could well happen, and I'm not going to deny it. I guess it could well happen that a person finds themselves experiencing or exposed to this form of pressure. But I'll tell you one form of the pressure that I do see quite a bit of, and it's almost the exact opposite of that, because there are people yeah. who contact my daughter. Oh, sorry. Has been Sorry, sorry, Phil. Another round of chemotherapy, and I just don't want to do it. And she says, "Don't give up." Mom. Sorry, Phil. Uh, can I can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt you? Um, I think we've got a bit of a delay. Yes. Oh yeah, sorry, I lost signal for a minute then, and you were making a super important point. So if you oh, it, it, now, now we've now we've got the signal back. Um, yeah, if you could just start no. again, you were t you were t you were you were talking about yeah, you were talking about seeing the opposite of that. Um, so if you could just start that point again, because it is super important. Yeah, I often hear about people, this argument that people will be pressured by society. 
it comes up a bit and people will say they'll be expected to do the right thing. Uh, and sometimes uh, I guess that could well happen. And I am, and I guess sometimes people will react to that pressure, but we see plenty of experiences where the I've seen the other way up too, where a person will contact me and say, look, my daughter's begged me to have another round of chemotherapy. She's saying, look, mum, you, 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 you've got to fight the cancer. She said, I've been fighting the cancer. I don't want to fight the cancer anymore. But my mother says to my, my daughter says, mum, give it one more round. She's saying, don't give up, keep fighting. So to satisfy this pressure that's being brought to bear by the family, she's actually prolonging one's life by going through a series of treatments which she sees benefit or wisdom in. Others come along and sometimes say, look, I'm consuming a huge amount of money. My treatment is costing a fortune. I want that money to go to my daughter or my son. I don't want to sit here and use it. I would feel better being allowed to die so that those resources are conserved and used by other people. So in a sense, there's a person who's experiencing, I don't know about pressure, there's a person who's saying, my, my decision to die or to take this elective step to end my life is in fact motivated by a desire to make life easier for other members of the family. So it's a very complex one, but to split give one side of it and say, oh, people might be pressured to die, misses out the whole spectrum of the sort of pressures that a person can be exposed to in these stages of their life. Yeah, I mean, again, just sort of, just sort of anecdotally touching on that, um, <laughs> resurrecting my dad a lot at the moment, be turning his bleeding grave. Well, he's not what we turn in his grave. He was his, his ashes, but never mind. <laughs> but um, yeah, I remember when. So my my dad uh, ultimately had cardiac arrest, and it was as a result of uh, he had myotonic dystrophy, which uh, like a mu form of muscular dystrophy. No cure for it. Pro getting progressively worse. Uh, he experienced the cardiac arrest, and then they injected him with adrenaline, and we were sort of in there with him. And the doctor and I, I was saying, I want to. The, the doctors wanted to turn the, the life support off and they wanted my permission to do it. And I was sort of, um, I was clinging on to, you know, just keep it going, just keep it going. Like, what if he's going to be okay? And I remember one of the doctors saying to me that it, it was something like, you know, the chances of him waking up uh, are, are like one less than 1%. And he said, and if he does wake up after what he's experienced, it might not be pretty. Um because, you know, cardiac arrest, again, can be a cause of brain damage and things like that. And so I'm I'm sat there, even after being given that advice by the doctor, I think I waited about another hour or so before I gave him the permission to, to turn the life support off because I'm, I'm clinging on to this idea that he's, you know, just sort of romantically going to wake up and everything's going to be okay. But out of my own selfishness, in that, in that last hour, I risked my that 1% of my dad waking up and being even worse, 10, 50 times worse than, than he'd been in his, in his life before that. And I know he'd never have wanted that. And if that would have happened to him, that would have been purely my selfishness that would have caused that. So that really is a, yeah, that really is a, a, a tricky one. Um, finally, before we get to the big one, Philip, which I'm really interested in, in, in seeing your uh, rebuttal to, is the, the link with sort of palliative care so sort of in two parts, this one, the first, the first part of it is that um, palliative care has, has come such a long way and it's so effective nowadays that pain can be alleviated that, you know, when it comes to someone that, that's, that's terminally ill, that so, palliative care is so good nowadays that it's that kind of suffering, un, intolerable suffering is sort of almost non-existent now. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I yes, I mean, I, I hear that argument quite a bit about palliative care. I'm sure that they, and they clearly have made some miraculous uh, steps, and there's all sorts of strategies which weren't available years back that are now promising, and they are effectively saying no one needs suffer. But of course, it's not just so-called suffering in any physical sense that makes a person take this step, and we see so much evidence of that. In fact, one of the interesting cases that I came across very early was the third person who wanted to use the Northern Territory law. She came from Sydney, rang me up and said, I'd like to come to Darwin to die. And I was asking about her symptoms and she said, well, actually, I haven't got too many. She said, I've had really fantastic palliative care here in Sydney, some of the best in the world. And I don't have anything. I had a bit of nausea, but that's all gone. The pain's pretty well met. I'm okay, really. 
And I said, well, why do you want to die? And she said, well, she said, this is not living. She said, I, I just sit here. She said, uh, the, the family will come around and say hello. And I say, then they go away again. Then they come back the next day, hello. She said, that's not living. She said, I'm here. I can't, I can't go out and play golf like I used to. She said, I can't do that. It's just the way of the way it is. She said, they've done a fantastic job, but, and I've got no symptoms as such, not what I want to be. I don't want to be like this. Now, I rang up her doctors as I had to do, and I said, look, Valerie wants to come to Darwin to die, and they just about got the chair. I said, what, Valerie? She's a poster child for palliative care. We've done a fantastic job. We've got rid of this. We've got rid of that. She's no symptoms of anything. Why isn't she happy? Why, effectively saying, why isn't she? And I said, look, she thinks she's wonderful. As a palliative care doctor, you're great, but that's not the goal. To her mind, that's not the goal. That's not the life she wants. It might be the life you think she should be happy with, but it's not the life that she wants. And she's made this decision, and she has every right to, under that law she did, to say, okay, I've seen, I've got what I can out of palliative care, but the decision is mine, and the decision is to die. And I think that's pretty well what I think I've been, I always, uh, as best I can, encourage people to get the best palliative care they can. But I'm not surprised when people say, I, I don't want to, or B, that I've already done all that, and uh, it's been good or not so good or whatever, but that's not really the decision. It's not just a simple case of take away the symptoms and everyone wants to live. The, 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 the decision-making equation is far more complex than that. Yeah, the the other part of palliative care, and I think this is I think this is a genuinely interesting point as well, is that the the introduction of youth euthanasia um, within the medical uh, field, especially if it was universal, it would that might disincentivize palliative care. It might disincentivize the uh, the the the. Ex- expanding and improving treatments that are already available in palliative care because you know some people are okay with palliative care some people do want to live as long as possible some people even if they they sat in a chair all day um you know are quite happy to sit there and read and and, and go on their iPad and and you know talk to the family and things like that and so by bringing in euthanasia it it, it was it's going to affect the palliative care field but even more, even more interestingly tied to that, it's this idea that euthanasia is going to discourage the uh, finding cures and treatments for for terminal illness in general. So you know, it, so instead of trying to find that sort of that miracle ca- universal cancer cure, if if it's just sort of accepted that you know after eight, eighty years of research or whatever, cancer seems to be that one thing that we can't get a handle on. Um, maybe euthanasia is the the way to go, and we we just sort of some diseases are just worth abandoning because we're never gonna we're never gonna get anywhere with them. And I, th- I think those are legitimate arguments, but I don't know. I don't know what you think of those. Well, I mean, this idea that there'll be some sort of undermining of any work in perhaps the provision of better palliative care, or as you say, even work on research to get the better or more cures for disease, because take this option and die i don't think uh, the idea that we're going to how i can go off and die is unlikely people want to live and they want to live for as long as they can and that's not going to change all as i'm suggesting is that when people do get to this point of deciding that now they've reached the time and they do want to die that choice must be available it's never going to be a lot of people that are out there saying oh good now i can die the idea that there's going to be some huge wave of elderly people suddenly saying, thank God we've got euthanasia. Now we're all going to get out there, get our Nambutel, swill it down, drop in the gutter. It's not going to happen. People want to live, but they occasionally get to the point where the equation is such that my life is best. I don't want my life, and I've reached that point where I want to It will always be a small group. But when they what when they come to that point voluntarily they should have this choice. So that's that's my that's my feeling. And the idea that there'll be some decision to not do cancer research, I think, is highly unlikely. It's driven and driven and driven by that ma- massive group of people that want to live forever. Right. Okay. So here we here we go, Philip. This is this is me bringing out the big guns now, <laughs> and this is this 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 is the the most sort of convincing argument I've seen. And I think it was. Obviously, I, I hadn't, th- you know, I'd sort of thought this issue through uh, to a, a, I guess, a, quite a shallow degree, really. Mine had always been sort of thinking about it in my my own circumstances. What would happen to me if I became terminally ill and it was painful? I hadn't really thought about it outside of that. But th- this this sort of challenges this idea that um, 
where you're saying that anybody of rational mind who has decided they should end the life should should be able to do that. And that would include, um, I don't want to misquote you, but that would say that would include, for instance, say a 24-year-old girl who is otherwise completely help, uh, otherwise completely physically healthy, but say she's been intensely depressed for a couple of years and she's convinced that she's sort of had enough and and now's the time to go you 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 would include that person as as a viable candidate am i correct as i outlined earlier my belief my fundamental belief is a rational adult should have this option and you described a person who may or may not be rational i mean the point about it is you can be depressed and lose mental capacity it's not that hard you can lose mental capacity. So then you don't fit the criteria. You really don't know what's in your best interest. And so you're making decisions which are not in your best interest, you could argue. If, however, that person has looked at all the options, done all the treatment, and for whatever reason is deemed to be of sound mind, and you can be depressed and of sound mind, yep. and makes the decision that their life is at such a level that they really prefer death, my argument is that they should have that choice. That's not overwhelmingly the position of the organization where people have got this or elected to have this 50-year criteria yep. my personal philosophic position the one that i feel most comfortable with, is this idea that if we are going to we need to accept a person's autonomy in this area and for whatever reason and you say oh she's just depressed or she's just this and she said all sorts of things go wrong and we can't go giving her that choice, but we're effectively trying to move into her, into her mind and try and make a decision based on our experience. She makes a decision. I don't know what's happened in her life, but if she's of sound mind and if she's decided that death is her preferred option, I think we have every obligation to make sure that, that, ability, that she has that ability and that the ability is one that she can carry out peacefully and reliably. Right. Okay. So if you just allow me to excuse me while I sort of filibuster for a couple of minutes here, because um, like I said, this, this, this podcast is sort of, it's rooted in uh, mental health and psychology. That was, that was originally why it started and was sort of very uh, stringent about the, the research that takes place uh, within this particular field. And so this, this one was particularly interesting for me as, as a point, this idea of somebody with um, who's depressed or who's purely making this decision based on some sort of psychiatric or, or psychological reasons. Um, so I've got to take, take for example, the, the there's a guy called Kevin Hines who, uh, age 19, back in uh, year 2000, he uh, tried to end his life by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and one of the things he said in the documentary reflecting on it was that he said that the, the moment he let go of the railings, he immediately regretted his decision. And as he was sort of plummeting into the water, it was just, he was filled with regret. All those problems that he felt he had before that suddenly sort of dissipated. And then during one of these, the documentary he was involved in, I believe they managed to track down 29 of the people, 20, 29 of the people who had survived um, a suicide attempt by jumping off uh, the, the Golden Gate Bridge. So there's only 29 people who were still alive who, who had done it. And it's very minimal. I think if you do it off the Golden Gate Bridge, you've, it's something like a, a one or 2% chance of survival. Um, and the, the interesting thing he found was that of all the 29 people that had tried to end the life and survived, they all said the same thing as him, that the moment they let go of the railing, they immediately regretted it. And um, he... He, like Kevin Hines himself now, you know, he's, he's still alive 20 years later, uh, works as an activist. He's, I think he's married. I don't know if he's got kids, but he seems seems quite happy. And that seems to tie in with the research as well. So I'm just going to uh, read read a few of them here. So uh, for a study from 2004, um, level of suicidal intent predicts overall mortality and suicide after attempted suicide, a 12-year follow-up study. So of 224 people who attempted suicide uh, and were treated at a healthcare facility, only 8% had died by suicide within 12 years. Um, a, a 2016 study, much, much larger than that, um, uh, followed 34,219 people who were hospitalized following an act of intentional self-harm. During three to nine years of follow-up, only 3.5% had died of, of suicide. Um, again, a study with, of 100 people with a 37-year follow-up, people who had attempted suicide, only 13% had died by suicide. Uh, and then finally, uh, a meta-analysis, 2014, uh, a meta-analysis by Robert Carroll 
he, he looked at 177 research studies around the world and found that only 4% of people who survived um, intentionally hurting or poisoning themselves went on to die by suicide within 10 years. And so the point I'm trying to drive home here is that in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, I mean, the, the upper limit looks to be around 8 to 10%. All these people that have come to the decision to end their own life, they were convinced, you know, and I mean, it takes a hell of, you know, again, from this podcast, we know it takes a hell of a lot of sort of mental anguish to, to reach that point. Um, and of all those people that made that, seemingly rational decision i mean in that 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 study where there's 34,000 people we have to assume that a good portion of those people were of rational and sound mind they decided to end the life they attempted it they failed and then lived to regret it or they lived or without even the regret aspect 37 year follow up 10 year follow up 9 year follow up 12 year follow up they're all still alive and they Again, if when it comes to sort of the advice that Exit International is giving out, which is to make sure that the method is, it's it's a solid, effective method, making sure that if you take that Nembutol or you step inside that sarcopod, you are going to die. And if you apply the logic of all those studies to the work that Exit International's done, you've got here, effect, you know, there's almost, um, including that Swedish study, you've got around 35,000 people that are going to be dead now that otherwise wouldn't have died. And so my argument here, which I feel like is the strongest one, is that maybe when it comes to psychiatric reasons um, outside of terminal illness, that maybe euthanasia is, and according to the data, maybe euthanasia is not, um, voluntary euthanasia is not a good idea. Um, so but are, like you, so are you suggesting then that uh, outside, of, outside of terminal illness, did you say, I, I just didn't hear that last bit that you just made the point you were outside of outside of some sort of physical suffering from disease is that what you're saying i guess so well obviously philip i've not um i've, I've got to be care i've got to be careful about making declarations like that because i've I, you know it's not something I've, I've thought through for an extended period of time but i'm just guessing based on based on the uh, on that data that's available there it would seem to me that now these presumably are people that are not suffering from terminal disease or they wouldn't still be alive presumably so you're suggesting at least that they lived on because they weren't suffering from some sort of uh, terminal medical malady, uh, that they had some non-medical reasons for taking this step of trying to end their lives. Is that the point? You yeah, making? yeah. That's well. I think that is the point I'm making, and as well, a lot of. If, I mean, I will include the links to the studies in the show notes for people. But um, a lot of the the people that were included on the list of people that had died within these various time periods, they did control for people dying of things like natural causes, things that were unrelated to the psychiatric issues. So I guess in general, to just to keep it simple, I, I guess I am saying that maybe maybe the dividing line between um, between offering these services to people should be some sort of uh you know physical pain terminal illness and that if it's if it's purely based on psychiatric reasons that that's maybe not a good enough reason to 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 offer it up well not to, when you say purely based on psychiatric reasons because i mean many of the people that take this step are, i mean it's hard to know what you're calling psychiatric reasons for example the woman who says that i'm going to be 80 and now i'm going to die is that a psychiatric reason well, I mean, as uh, you've already given away, Philip, that you, if you're a, you're a reader of Thomas Zass, um, this is a, this is a this is a very tricky um, this is a very tricky road to go down the boundaries of what's a psychiatric, you know, what's a valid diagnosis, and whether whether or not certain uh, thoughts and feelings should be uh, sort of medicalized. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to keep. I'm trying to keep this simple without us going down a sort of a Zassian philosophical rabbit hole. Um, yeah, I'm going to stick to that and say if it's um, if it's if it's a mood. All right, let me. Okay, <laughs> I like this. Let's complicate it a little bit and say if it's sort of if it's a a mood related disorder. I guess. That would exclude an 80-year-old woman who, who says, look, I'm not depressed. I'm fine. I've lived a long life. It's been great. But I've had enough. I would say taking the context into consideration uh, versus, uh, a, you say, a, you know, a 24-year-old who's saying they're severely depressed. They don't feel like they're ever going to get better. I would argue that taking the, the these ideas of psychiatric diagnosis 
out of the equation, I would argue that there's a fairly solid dividing line between those two cases. So, like I say, if we're just talking about things like, um, yeah, mood-related disorders, coupled yeah. with coupled 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 with those statistics there, where the vast majority of people that attempt suicide that one time do not go on to die by suicide, I'd argue there's a fairly convincing case there of some some implementing some sort of dividing line between uh, psychiatric reasons and and other reasons such as being elderly, being infirm, terminal illness, things like that. Well, I don't know. I, I would have trouble with that argument. I mean, what about, a, well, I'm just going to use one other example because we, we ran into this. I ran into this in some detail. What about the 45-year-old who's going to prison for 30 years at least? Is that person, and that decides then he's going to kill himself rather than go to prison? And he said, that was my rational decision. Now, is that person acting on the basis of some sort of mood uh, perturbation or are we talking here about a psychiatric illness? Are we talking about a rational decision that life in prison uh, because of the fact that he'd been uh, found guilty of killing two previous partners uh, meant that it was going to be such a miserable experience to his perception at the time? Maybe it wouldn't be, but at his perception at the time, it would be such a horrific experience that he would rather be dead. So he made what seemed to me to be at least the rational decision that didn't seem to be affected by some sort of mood swings okay so are we are we leaving are we leaving aside the argument that that somebody like that shouldn't be offered the a, a chance of sort of peaceful voluntary euthanasia based on the fact that they owe a debt to society <laughs> yeah so that argument has called that came up a lot about i mean that person yes many people said well hell no they've got to pay their they've got to pay their dues they need to go to go to jail and effectively suffer which seemed to be most mostly those comments motivated by revenge which I didn't have a lot of time for, but in, in well, any no, event, let me, let me throw in another one. I mean, I don't want to go too far off topic, but I, I wouldn't say like a vengeance motive. But I think, uh, especially especially in the case of murderers, if if that if that guy is taking it upon himself to decide the fate of of two other women, then it's not unfair for the state to judge him by his own standards and punish him by his own standards, which is you think it's okay to decide somebody else's fate. So we're going to decide your fate for you. And that's by your own standard. Um, well, I mean, I, that, that, I guess that's, that's how many, many people, many people looked at it. I, I, I mean, I, I, this has come up a bit in, I've been involved in these discussions about my belief that people that are given life without parole should be, uh, if the state is going down that path of uh, issuing such penalties, and they do in many places, that that is a tantamount to torture. The state should have no part of it, but if it is going to have a part, then the state at least should have the option of provide, or should have the requirement of providing for that person uh, the ability to have an elective death. Now, that's mm. not a popular view, but it's one that I think can be compellingly argued. And I don't want to go down that particular yeah. side either, either. But getting back to your original argument about the people that you see as being motivated or effectively making the decisions on the basis of some mood disturbance, yep. which you seem to be steering away from the idea of saying that they're, but they're not mentally incapable. In other words, you're assuming that they've got mental capacity and with that mental capacity, albeit mood disturbed, they then make a decision to die. They survive somehow or other, and then overwhelmingly, almost universally, say, "Well, I'm so glad that was an awful decision and a mistake. That I'm so pleased that it didn't work." That seems to be the statistic that you're providing and saying, "Well, doesn't that tell us something?" Yeah, it tells yep. us that all these people are, are doing the wrong thing, and they shouldn't have had to go through that sort of experience to reach that sort of decision. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's the point. And the point is it's that sort of experience that makes them make that sort of decision. And so to try and suggest that that's a pre-position, a position that they held before they took that step can't be established. It could well have been that, it could well have been the experience of their near-death experience that so changed them yeah. that suddenly they see a different life in front of them. Yeah. Now, the only way to get that experience and to come back as that different person is to have one of these near-death experiences, I suppose we should be making almost certain suicides more readily available, but I think it'd be a disaster. The person has made the decision, okay, it at least, I think, is incumbent on us to make sure that if they've made that decision, that that decision is respected, not trying to trick them into having a nearly dying experience so that they have some sort of mental conversion due, due to the process. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I have actually had this discussion in private with somebody before. We've sort of talked about this issue and whether there was any sort of um, just spitballing this idea of a sort of Russian roulette machine <laughs> that, you know, when people could sort of, they've decided that they want to die. And so if they press press the button and they do die, well, they, in that moment, it's um, their their wish was granted to them. Um, and so there's there's nothing unethical taking place. But if they press the button and nothing happens, but they think it's going to happen, it, it gives them the experience that, oh, I've pressed the button and now I'm going to die. And then ultimately they don't they may have some sort of revelatory moment based on this sort of Russian roulette machine, um, which they can then step out of and say, oh, I've realised everything was okay after all and I can sort out my problems. Or they, they get out and they're disappointed and they say, well, actually, I wanted it to happen, in which case they can get back in and do it properly. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is... It's the basis for some quite, uh, quite uh, cheap uh, therapy. <laughs> yes, it's, it, is, it is a tricky one, but you, it's, at least for me... At least for me, it, it for someone who would have, like I say, before this conversation would have argued that, you know, nine, I'd have been 95 to 99% on board with, with everything you said, that bringing that consideration in, it, it widens, it, for me, it definitely widens that, that grey area a bit. Um, and it makes it, you know, it makes it even more tricky. And to the point you brought up about this Zassian idea of, uh, whether or not this idea of mental illness, whether it even exists, and if it does exist, where do the boundaries lie between the varying diagnoses and things like that? Because if you bring in a psychiatrist to uh, decide whether or not somebody qualifies to uh, choose to end their own life, the literature seems to show that in the vast majority of the time, psychiatrists often don't know what they're talking about anyway to begin with, uh, which is tricky. But then also with your idea of bringing in some sort of AI system um, ultimately, the AI is programmed by humans, and if the, the the AI is programmed by humans based on psychological science, which is malleable and and flawed as it is, again, even with the AI intervention, how is that accurately going to um, decide whether or not somebody's capable? And so, for me, like I say, it, I'm I'm still overwhelmingly in favour of it as a concept, but I do think this idea of when you when you make the dividing line, someone's making a, a rational decision. I think that brings in a very a very sort of tricky tricky grey area. Which I don't know if we we can hash it out between the two of us here. But we haven't haven't got the time to do it. Um, it's probably best left into to the YouTube comment section. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I will leave the final word to you to you on that. All right. Well, thank you. I uh, know. I mean, the AI thing is fraught with difficulty, and I accept all of that. And of course, it brings with it its own baggage. But of course, so do psychiatrists. And so, the idea is to try and to try and effectively neutralise that uh, that particular baggage that the, the individual variations within the profession bring. But it is fraught with difficulty. It's a difficult project. On the other hand, uh, one would be naive to think that AI isn't changing many, many aspects of the way medicine is carried out. And I've watched closely and with some interest this, and I can't see why this vexed problem of trying to work out pretty fundamental thing. Do you have capacity or don't you? Now, law courts want to know this all the time. When you're being dragged in front of a, a courtroom for trial for a, some form of uh, law breach, the argument will be made that you knew what you were doing. So someone has to say you have mental capacity or you didn't have mental capacity. And yet it seems to me we're left with this fundamental decision being decided by this one rather small group in society who claim that they're the only ones in the universe who can do it. That is the psychiatrists. Yep. Now, I think that needs to be closely looked at. Uh, this question about whether you have mental capacity or not is fundamental and it's a hard one. And uh, it's one that we spend a lot of time... Uh, a lot of time worrying about, and uh, yeah, so I won't even get onto the get onto the work that's going on on that particular issue with dementia. The dementia thing is going is really interesting because uh, you, you may well be aware of the debate going on in the Netherlands now about whether advanced directives can be used to uh, form the basis of some doctor putting you down, and that the High Court, the Supreme Court in the Hague, has accepted this. There's a lot of controversy, but one of the way, ways that we're really pushing this now is a solution to that problem, which can't be. Uh, by using advanced directives. We are really pushing for some form of implantable switch, which you you have the control of and you have to switch off every day or the device kills you. Now, that, that idea has been around for a while, but it's really starting to gather some momentum now. Uh, and uh, obviously, at a certain age, you might think, hell, I'm a candidate for dementia. There's no cure to Alzheimer's yet. I want one of those implantable switches. 
and then every day you get a little, you get a little alarm bell and it says so do you want to switch me off or not and if you sort of forgotten or I can't work out or I'm not too sure what the hell this is all about it does the job for you and doesn't leave it up to some poor bloody hapless doctor who has to come along look at a piece of paper that says look if you see me like this kill me and look at someone who really doesn't know which way is up and have to take that step because I think that's one of the hard I would ne never comfortably part be part of that which is a com effectively what the uh, what the court has endorsed uh, but uh, it's an issue which we spend a lot of time concerned about and the sooner we can get I feel the psychiatrist out of the equation and bring in the AI with all its problems, the better. Yeah. Oh, dementia. I miss that one. That may, may be, may be one for a, a future, a future conversation at some point, but for now, I think we're going to leave it there. So uh, yeah, in the meantime, Philip, I don't know if there's any, um, like as always, I know it's, I know it's an uncomfortable topic for, for many people, but uh, as always, I am going to offer you the, the opportunity to, you know, plug away at any websites, books, projects you're involved in, anything you'd like to make the, the listeners aware of. Oh, okay. Well, no, I can, no, if, if the listeners are aware, look, please follow the, uh, please follow uh, what Exit is doing on our website, exitinternational.net. We've started our podcast series, which seems to be going very well. We've only done four, but the last one, which was on Sunday, went very well. And that's all about this strategy of giving people access to drugs and making sure that they can get them. There's a lot of interest out there. So please feel free to follow along or contact us on our, uh, on our email address and ask any questions that you might have. Right, okay, there we go. That's uh, another, another difficult conversation out of the way. Philip Nietzsche, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you.